Good afternoon, Finland. How's everyone doing? Not too hungover? That's fantastic. You could make it to the talk. Wonderful, wonderful. And I'd uh, like to thank Disobey for loaning me a laptop because mine broke. Don't worry, it wasn't coded by Boeing. It wasn't another failure on their part. So I'd like to talk about a little story and an adventure that I went on with uh, Boeing and uh, some of their uh, employees as well some of the fun that I had. So since this is the first time I've been in Finland, a lot of you don't know me, my name is Chris Kubeka, and I actually deal a lot in the cyber warfare space. So uh, I was the one that was called up by Saudi Aramco to reconnect all of their international business and reestablish all of their international business operations. <clears throat> uh, in addition to that, I advise various EU governments and also part of the US government and dealing with strategies concerning what happens if there is a joint attack against both the EU and the US, and things of that nature. Uh, in addition to that, I deal a lot with critical infrastructure, and in the ICS world, uh, my areas are oil and gas, of course, from Aramco, uh, but also uh, energy of all different sorts, especially nuclear, and uh, also aviation and maritime. And Previous to my career at Aramco, I also was in the US Air Force, started my career as a military aviator, and then moved on to Space Command, not Space Force. Uh, this was actually the aircraft that I used to fly on. I was the loadmaster on that aircraft, which is like the flying calculator of it and the ground commander. So I come from an aviation background. I'm not just a hacker, right? So when we talk about the aviation industry, we're talking about a very, very old industry. Uh, for example, KLM has been in the air for now 100 years, since 1919. And when you have an industry that uh, is so old, you're going to have a lot of legacy devices. Yay! Who likes flying? Who likes flying? I'll, I'll ask that question again after this. Uh, another problem is when you're dealing with a company that's been around for a long time, like Boeing, they're going to have a lot of things on the internet that uh, they may not even know about. And this can be very problematic. This happens with a lot of big companies. A lot of entry points, and a lot of exit points, and so far forth. They also have a lot of third parties that they have to deal with that tie into their systems, that provide them different types of uh, code, and so forth. Then they also have to be very, very concerned about intellectual property theft, because that's basically their bread and butter. If somebody steals an aircraft design and makes it in another country like China, and what happened with Lockheed Martin's fighter jet, that can be a very, very bad thing. Now, to give you a rough estimate, uh, intellectual property theft actually costs the US taxpayer about $6 billion a year. Yes, there's a reason why China has uh, awards for their citizens bringing back intellectual property. And unfortunately, with many, many companies, uh, security is something that really isn't thought of that much. Uh, in the case of Boeing, one of the things they still don't understand is they're actually an IT company who just happens to make aircraft because nowadays aircraft are gigantic IoT devices. Yay, we love IoT, especially planes. Yay. So to give you an idea of some of my motivations, um, when I was reading about the story from Ethiopian Airlines, I got a little uh, angry and frustrated with Boeing's response. The reason being is I myself have been in in-flight emergencies and also an airplane crash. And I know from my background in the aviation industry that Ethiopian Airlines is one of the safest airlines in the world. That might surprise a lot of people. Uh, Lion Air does not have as good of a reputation. Uh, they're still struggling with their safety. But when I uh, took a look at the case of Ethiopian Airlines, and saw that uh, their alternate maneuver of what they were supposed to do as pilots was actually physically impossible. And I also read more that they were doing this in-flight emergency for 12 minutes. 
that's a very, very long time for both an air crew person or for passengers, because at the time, the nose of the aircraft was being tilted downwards by 20 degrees over and over again. Now imagine being on that aircraft. That would not be a good time. Uh, less than a week ago, an aircraft I was in, leaving London uh, City Airport, had to slam on its brakes because we almost uh, collided with a landing aircraft. And uh, everyone on board was, we'll say, quite surprised with that one, right? So at the end, looking at Lion Air and looking at Ethiopian Airlines, 357 people died in those two airplane crashes. And Boeing's response was very unfortunate. They blamed the pilots. They said that they did not have good training. And that's quite ironic since Boeing had withheld information from those two airlines about what they would need to do in case their sensor went bad. So in April of last year, I started fooling around and I go, hmm, I wonder if I can see any general bad coding practices on the external facing portion of Boeing. And the first website that I came across was actually their aviation ID system. Now, to give you a bit of some information, what happens is when you go to update an aircraft or a satellite up in space, um, you have to download the software and upload it somehow. In the case of an aircraft, that's to a maintenance laptop, which is then physically plugged into an aircraft. And the way that you get this aviation flight control software is actually, in Boeing's case, behind the aviation ID system. You're supposed to have some good login credentials, and then you can download everything you want. Yay! Go internet. Now, unfortunately, first thing I did, like many of us do in this room, we look at the HTML page source. And towards the bottom in the copyright, I found something very funny, and I had to send a pilot friend a copy of what I had found, and his comment was basically, maybe I shouldn't extrapolate code from the flight control code website. Laugh out loud. And the first thing that stuck out was this comment that a developer had actually left in. No idea what this does, it only prints null. And this is unfortunately a very good indicator that the developer didn't know how to escape special characters. Uh, there were a lot of problems in the HTML code. Uh, mostly it was made up of if-then-else statements. Uh, I also ended up finding six cross-site scripting exploitable vulnerabilities because when I downloaded everything and tested it in my lab, I could exploit it like pop, pop, pop. And I actually sent a tweet out wearing a face mask going, hey, hey, does anybody know anyone in Boeing? Because I just got my sixth cross-site scripting, and um, I really need to stop. Uh, there's only so much one can do. So after that tweet, I was contacted by a person who worked for the US Aviation ISAC, which is an information sharing association in the United States. And he asked me, hey, can you send us a report of everything that's wrong? Uh, immediately after I was contacted by that individual, I was then contacted by someone in the UK who said they wanted to put me in touch with Department of Homeland Security's ICS cert and to not work with the US Aviation ISAC. This was a strange message, not what you would expect. So over that weekend, I began writing my report and it was 59 pages long. There is only so much you can put in a report. Um, and I had reached my maximum at this point. Uh, some of the things that I pointed out were that Boeing had a very high threat profile because they handle classified and unclassified systems and also passenger and air crew safety are involved. Uh, in addition to that, um, not only was national security at risk, but uh, they didn't really have this concept of something called secure access at all. Uh, they had an eight character password complexity with no requirement of uppercase or, 
or lowercase or special characters to get into the aviation ID system to get the flight control software both live and test. And they also had lots of other little problems, such as I successfully could spoof the CEO's email because they had never set up something as simple as DMARC. In addition to that, a lot of the coding was done by a third party called Exostar, who also uh, is in the market for aviation and space and codes up a lot of authentication login websites for that particular industry, for the US, for the UK, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. So some of the highlights were, um, I commonly use a browser called Firefox with no script. And I happened to find in census.io certificate properties, which said, oh, Boeing has a certificate for test aviation ID. That can't be online, can it? Well, it turns out it was. And when I went to the website, all it said was, you're not running JavaScript, please press this button. How many of you would have pressed that button? Right, I did. And it bypassed all authentication and it took me into their research and development servers and into their test environment and their test flight code for all of their aircraft. Uh, so this was quite unfortunate because as a person who used to uh, lead and head uh, security operations centers, you don't really monitor your test development systems because there's a lot of things that are being fired off against it and it would be a lot of false positives. And you don't want your actual people concentrating on that instead of concentrating on the real events. In addition to that, test and development systems. They're tied to real systems on the inside. So you can rather easily pivot from that press that button to get in to pivot directly inside of Boeing. And this was written up in the report as well. They didn't have this concept called encryption, which I thought was a little strange since firstly, they do handle classified systems. And secondly, Boeing actually sells cybersecurity services to the US government. So this was a little strange. Uh, where they did use some encryption, they had very outdated ciphers with uh, known problems uh, where you could easily uh, crack those ciphers. And one of, I, I will say, piece de resistance was the fact that they were using an older version of SAML on a bunch of their login pages, including for the live actual flight control software, and they had hard-coded the credentials in it. So uh, there wasn't much hacking that needed to be done because they had already hacked themselves in essence. Now, one of the reasons why I was told not to work with the US Aviation uh, ISAC was because I was told that uh, they do not like people discussing vulnerabilities with any of their systems. And there are now several lawsuits by employees and third parties uh, dealing with Boeing in the court systems now, both in the United Kingdom and the United States, because Boeing uh, apparently, so that I don't get sued, apparently, uh, perhaps, have blackmailed, used extortion and coercion against individuals who have also even raised issues about safety issues, such as most recently, an engineer for Boeing brought up the fact that a quarter of the uh, oxygen masks could not deploy in the 787 Dreamliner in case of emergency because Boeing supposedly had swapped the parts on the assembly line for cheaper um, oxygen nozzles. And that person has an active lawsuit against Boeing now because they blackmailed him, supposedly, and forced him into early retirement. To give you an example, uh, there had also been a previous researcher who took a lot of heat for uh, discussing things about Boeing. And to this day, he will not discuss anything Boeing related with anyone. So I'm not sure what happened, 
but he's not talking to anybody for um, very good reasons. So in the report that I wrote, I pointed this out because this was going to the Department of Homeland Security, uh, that Boeing had threatened uh, any security researcher who divulges any vulnerabilities about our systems, we will turn our entire legal and PR apparatus against them. Now, this doesn't sound nice. And I've actually been sued before uh, by companies uh, although I've won every single time. But uh, legal bills are legal bills, and they can be kind of expensive. I think the last one cost me about 20,000 euros just to fight it and win the court case. And uh, also, at the same time, nobody wants the reputation right. And in addition to that, uh, less than a year ago, uh, I got out of a wheelchair because I had been long-term sick from an illness that I picked up in uh, East Africa in Tanzania. So I'd gone through a very long uh, medical battle where I was between life and death and in a wheelchair a lot of the time. So I was trying to get back up and running as a professional and these types of threats, I took them extremely seriously. So to give you a, a good example of the fact that they didn't know what encryption actually was, this was a screenshot of the Boeing website where it is just HTTP, there is no encryption, and Boeing did not encrypt their web pages until October 29th of last year. Yes, I've seen faces. You're like, no, this can't be true. Yeah, yeah. Remember, they sell cybersecurity consulting services to the US government, right? Everybody feels warm and fuzzy now. Yay! In addition to that, I found that there had been a targeted malware issue coming out of their servers, which involved documents such as 737max.pdf, um, again, I could spoof anyone's email account at Boeing. Uh, they had a whole bunch of remote management. Yay, FTP, it rocks. And uh, Exostar, the coding that they used was really, really bad. Uh, this is what one of the malware infections looked like. And what's interesting about this was only 21 of the 71 antivirus vendors could actually pick up on it. And the ones that could were actually oddball ones. They weren't major ones. And uh, th this is a little odd. Um, and I belong to Virus Total for 11 years. So I do a lot of malware research as well. It's one of my favorite things. So. Last year, I was going to be including Boeing in my talk, Hack the World with Open Source Intelligence Gathering at the DEF CON ICS Village, but I was asked nicely by Department of Homeland Security not to say their name in that presentation at the time until they could actually uh, try to start fixing things. But uh, two nights before, I was sent an email from what was supposedly the security manager of Exostar and this person had detailed my tweets, a podcast I was in, date and time stamping, and so forth. And the first thing I thought when I saw the email was this was, this was written by a lawyer. And I just so happened to have a very good friend of mine who is a lawyer, and that was also her first uh, reaction as well. So the email that I sent back to Exostar, I'll just point out in red, um, this feels a little bit like uh, a chilling effect in what the EFF would uh, label it. In addition to that, all of the research that I did I took place in the Netherlands, and in the Netherlands we have some very strong laws to protect security researchers, of which I did not fall afoul and I did not break any laws. I also pointed out that censorship is illegal in the Netherlands for a reason. So a big company can't just uh, try to get me to sign an NDA in the Netherlands. That's considered censorship. They can't just uh, have a judge issue a cease and desist. That can only come from the Dutch prosecutor. Otherwise, it's considered censorship. 
And in addition to that, I repeated something that the Department of Homeland Security told me themselves, was that they wanted the names of any person or organization who uh, tried to threaten me in any litigious manner, censor or try to bully me. Because Department of Homeland Security said that they would be turning it into a teaching moment. Yes, taking them to school. So another reason why I was told not to work with the US Aviation ISAC, in the top picture, that was the person who had contacted me about sending them a report. And he said, oh, I run the ISAC. I also happen to be a Boeing employee. How many of you think that Boeing would have fixed anything if I had reported any of this to the US Aviation ISAC? For the record, nobody raised their hand. Uh, in addition to that, um, the bottom one, uh, the CEO of the US Aviation ISAC, that was from a media article about this, he insisted that uh, no Boeing employees or US Aviation ISAC employees ever came to my hotel or threatened me or tried to get me to sign an NDA. The middle picture, it's actually in Central European time from my calendar, that is Doug Blau, a Boeing employee who also ran the US Aviation ISAC. And he came to my hotel, that was the hotel that I was staying in during last year's hacker summer camp, and he tried to get me to sign an NDA, of which I said, I don't need to sign an NDA. I don't have to sign an NDA, and I'm not going to sign an NDA. So uh, finally, uh, Department of Homeland Security, they took a look at my report and asked for my permission to send it to Boeing. And I said, yes, of course, because I want Boeing to actually fix some of these things. Now, Boeing did not uh, respond to everything that I put down, but uh, to summarize some of their report feedback, they insisted that there was no malware. However, in 2017, there was a malware infection coming out of their email servers, which they denied over and over again, and it turned out that it was absolutely true. So. I don't really trust Boeing that much. Uh, they were saying that they were looking into deploying DMARC. Uh, they have since uh, decided to deploy DMARC by going with uh, Office 365. Uh, for the SAML credentials, uh, what they said was, well, you know, it might be a problem, but we're meeting the regulation from NIST, so it's fine. Like, magically, there's no problem with hard-coded credentials, right? For login systems to get into the live aviation ID system and into live in-production flight control software for aircraft and for satellites. It meets NIST. It's OK. Magic rainbows and unicorns. Uh, for the exposed development systems, uh, they referenced the email systems for some strange reason, and then said, you know, we know it's exposed. However, it's performing as intended. Yay, more magic and rainbows and unicorns. And then they uh, said for the password complexity that they were working on making it more secure. So here's where I, I divert a little and go, how many of you think that uh, you would want um, a nice security researcher to report to your company and write a pretty good report and um, want your company to respond back in this manner? Especially if your personal data was there. Especially if it uh, could cause issues with safety, loss of life or limb, right? So this was my reaction. And this also was privately the Department of Homeland Security reaction. Uh, in addition to that, uh, they still did not respond uh, adequately about the malware issue. And right now, I'm actually working with the Chicago office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation uh, about this particular matter. Now. Uh, back in late December, I was given the opportunity to use a tool to demo it out for free. 
and I found a new series of infections uh, involving malware and the Boeing email servers. Now, because I don't have access to all the evidence, I can't say for sure because I don't have control of the command and control servers or one of the Boeing assets. However, uh, in addition to finding additional malware issues, also Japan Cert became involved with this as well a couple of weeks ago to try to see if the command and control server was within their jurisdiction so that they could contact law enforcement. Pony Loader is known to be a credential harvester. Just what everybody wants on classified systems. Now, here's where the story takes a bit of a turn. Uh, late last year, I was requested by a member of the Dutch government to contact the Federal Bureau of Investigation to ask them if they would open up an investigation for coercion that Boeing had used coercive illegal methods to keep things quiet. And uh, one of the reasons for that was in 2009, there was a Turkish Airlines plane crash involving the aircraft of 737NG. It actually crash landed at Schiphol Airport on an alternate runway. Uh, that plane actually almost took out the building I was working at at Schiphol. So I was actually there when it crashed. And uh, the news broke about two weeks ago that Boeing and the US uh, Safety Board actually uh, apparently coerced the Dutch government to remove information out of the safety report concerning the sensor that went wrong on that aircraft. And that same sensor and the same code on that 2009 airplane crash was used in the 737 MAX. So if uh, apparent coercion had not occurred, 357 people would still be alive today. I'm now in touch with uh, one of my MPs uh, in the Netherlands who has been quite vocal about this matter. In addition to that, uh, Boeing is a publicly traded company. And per 2017 guidelines from the Securities and Exchange Commission, they're required to tell their shareholders about any major cybersecurity risks that could affect their intellectual property and diminish uh, what their stock is actually worth. Makes sense, right? You want to know what you're buying before you buy it. So I've been in touch with the SEC lawyers. Uh, we talked at length. And if need be, I will be uh, getting uh, whistleblower protection from the SEC as well. One of the reasons for this is because Boeing is a very, very, very powerful corporation, and they are known to try to shut people down using any means. I also have the protection of the Department of Homeland Security and the protection of the Dutch government and assurances from the Dutch prosecutor's office that I did not do anything illegal and no criminal charges would be pressed against me. In addition to that, Boeing did not tell people that they were breached back in 2018, the same R&D systems that I was able to get into. They also did not fix anything. So this is a timeline that was leaked to me by a whistleblower. And uh, what had happened was someone was able to press that button as well, get in, download all of the flight control software, including for the 737 MAX. Boeing did not fix anything. And they decided to issue this thing called an airworthiness certificate that every single one of their planes that they ever manufactured met the cybersecurity requirements for airworthiness. And we're talking about planes that are not IoT devices, we're talking about 50-year-old planes. So the issuance of that certificate was most likely this thing called fraud. And other people whistled blue to me as well. Uh, there was a company that was a third party for Boeing when they tried to report corruption. They were actually blacklisted from ever doing business with Boeing again. Now, Department of Homeland Security they asked me privately, would you mind taking a look at Boeing again to see if they fixed anything? Well, as soon as they said that, I said, yay, let my fingers do the surfing. And I immediately found with no encryption, no authentication, a way to see all of the in-cabin IoT cameras 
on all of the Boeing aircraft that have them enabled. So if you flew on a Boeing aircraft last September and October, I might have seen you. Yay! So has there been any improvement at Boeing? Well, because of my report, they actually started their very first vulnerability disclosure program. So that was a good win. However, the PGP key that they posted actually was just gibberish, and it still doesn't function. <laughs> um, they finally started uh, rolling out uh, encryption certificates. However, while I was uh, attending the previous talk, I wanted to double check a few things, and it turns out that their VPN server um, has uh, no actual encryption certificate. It's, it's misconfigured. Uh, as is their business intelligence and analytics uh, systems, which are exposed to the internet without a functioning uh, certificate. So logins, logins, logins. Uh, they ended up escalating with the journalists who covered this story. Their legal department contacted the media organization's legal department, his editor and senior editor, which did not go over well. The journalist said, you know, this is you know, an attempt at censorship. They also launched a Twitter bot campaign against him. Uh, in addition to that, when I contacted Department of Homeland Security and I said, hey, whatever Boeing's doing with that media organization, this went from a small story to a much bigger story because of it. And shortly after my phone call with them, Boeing's legal department actually had the, won't say balls, balls to uh, contact Department of Homeland Security legal department to try to apply pressure on them as well. Go Boeing. Uh, Exostar, who does all of this authentication coding for the aviation and space industry, um, they still don't have a vulnerability disclosure program. However, they have not been hassling me uh, again, which is kind of nice. Now, the picture that you see here, this is actually the brand new CEO of Boeing. He's got three albums out. I happen to be, I think, uh, his only subscriber on one of his YouTube channels. And his latest album is called Day Drinkin'. With my favorite lines, take your hand off the throttle and put it on your wife, or chillin' in the cockpit with a cold beer. So I, I encourage you, okay, I would encourage you to listen but it's really not very good music. So I wouldn't want to torture you like that. So are there solutions to any of this? Well, during uh, part of this, Boeing tried to accuse me of being a criminal hacker and trying to extort them for money. So I sent them a picture of the NSA director that I took last April at a closed conference. And I said, if you want, I could probably get you an autograph because they didn't look me up very well. So we aren't criminals in this room. We're trying to do something to make the world a bit better because our modern world is the digital world. Uh, in addition to that, they had a very, very light, non-destructive pen test for free. I did ask for a t-shirt. And what I wanted the t-shirt to say was, I hacked Boeing and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. I don't think they laughed. Um, now, because of uh, Boeing's public image issue, uh, they're going to need to involve a lot more stakeholders. There are pilots who have contacted me with concerns. There are CEOs of, we'll say, uh, three major uh, US airlines who actually voice their support for me uh, in private. So they're going to have to include those stakeholders as well as people like you and me, because we all fly on aircraft, I assume. How many of you don't fly on an aircraft? I saw one, two, maybe, right? So um, they're going to have to fix this. They also have to make vulnerability disclosure a routine with a working PGP key, for goodness sakes. So um, I tried to leave some time for questions, because the last speaker had four questions. So I'm looking forward to questions, because I like questions. I uh, wanted to give a quick thank you very much to Disobey for accepting this talk and also to the journalist who uh, took a lot of heat for actually writing up this story, as well as Department of Homeland Security, who were very, very nice and tried to work with me as best as they could, even though they had legal pressure on themselves. 
uh, in addition to the free tool that I had used from Looking Glass. And um, although it's not official, but the BBC uh, over in the UK is actually looking at doing a documentary on some of these issues with the 737 MAX. And I've already been interviewed for it to be included about the software vulnerability and bad coding practices that I was able to find in all of this. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attendance, even though I heard there was this great after party last night, but I had to be a good girl and I wanted to be fresh for this talk. So I'm ready for any questions that anyone has.